are willing to admit that you are cheap. How many of you are willing to admit you're cheap? And, you know, as us who are cheap like to call it, we're frugal, we're thrifty, we're money smart, we're wise with our funds, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but at the end of the day, we're, we're cheap. Um, I, am, I can say this because sometimes I think I'm probably the king of cheap at times, or so I used to be. And I'm not talking about being wise cheap, but being frugal, okay? Um, Shannon is very wise with money. She knows how to spot a good quality deal, and she gets a good quality deal, and I appreciate that she brings that into our household because she's smart when she goes and looks at a deal and she says, this is a good deal, this is not, and she is frugal. She's wise cheap. I am not so much. Um, she can tell you that there's many things when we first got married that she had to challenge my mindset on because my thought was, hey, why pay Thirty or forty dollars for the good pair of runners that I need that actually support my feet the way they should and are not going to give me knee problems. When I can go to Walmart and buy off the cheap discount route with a five dollar pair that nobody else wants because it's got no arch support and it looks like it's going to fall apart. But for me, it was like, hey, it's cheap, so it's good. And I must admit, I have Mennonite roots, so it probably comes as part of my DNA. But when I was at uh, Bible school the first time around, I remember sitting in, in, in the, one of the orientation sessions, and one of our profs got up. He says, so you are at a Mennonite school. He says, I'm going to teach you all you need to know about being a Mennonite. I thought, okay, this should be good because I need to get in touch with my heritage here. And he says, the first rule of being a Mennonite is never turn down anything that's free. He says, meals, clothing, you name it. And if they want to give you more, don't turn it down because you are a Mennonite and not only a Mennonite student, so just take whatever they can give you. I mean, it's okay to be cheap. Now, there were times when my cheapness was embarrassing. I, I try not to do this anymore because I know it's not healthy for me and I shouldn't do this. But one of my favorite places to be cheap was Costco on sample day. Um, <laughs> those of you who go to Costco know exactly what I am talking about. Has anybody else here who's willing to admit it discovered the joy of taking laps around the Costco food section, hitting up as many as, yes, as many as the sample trays as you can, and, you know, when you're done, the first 13 of them, you're like, okay, well, it's been about 45 minutes to hit all 13 up. They don't recognize me. Let's go for seconds. I've done that. And, you know, I figured at the time, I pay enough for my yearly membership. And this is the cheap part of me talking. I figured... If I'm going to pay 55 bucks or 60 now it is for a yearly membership, I better get a free meal at least once out of it. So I figure, why not? Well, we would be at Costco, and I used to hear all the time Shen saying, seriously, don't be so cheap. She might even throw in there, you know, really, I know it's in your blood, but you don't have to be such a Mennonite. <laughs> and my response is, well, hey, it's part of my genes, it's part of my DNA, I can't ignore it, and besides, you're married to me and you're stuck with me now, so I guess... It'll all be okay. You know, there's a time and place where being cheap is beneficial and where it is wise, okay? There's a time where being frugal is great. Yet it becomes a problem when being cheap holds you back from doing what is right. When we are cheap with God, it isn't a value to be celebrated, but speaks to how much we love and submit to God. I want to put a key phrase up on the screen this morning is this. How generous we are towards God speaks of our depth of love for him. The thought here is that if you deeply love God, then you will want to be generous towards him with your resources. And full disclosure this morning, if you think that we're talking about money this morning, yes, we are. Yes, it's not comfortable but I believe this is where God wants us to park as we look through Malachi this morning. And I'm actually going to invite you to flip to Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. We're going to pick up in verse 6. And feel free to grab a Bible in the front rack in front of you if you don't have one. We're going to also put the words on the screen. And you know, like we said last week, I'm going to invite you, I know this is kind of awkward, but I invite you to kind of have a, have a smartphone-free zone here for the next 40 minutes or so, so that we don't have any distractions. I mean, I know some of you for work have to have one on you, and that's fine. But for us, let's just... Put them on silence, put them under a seat or whatever, so we don't need to look at them. We can just focus on what God wants to say to us this morning. You know, the book of Malachi, like I spoke about last week as we kind of recap where we were at, is all about return. It's a book about the loving God, the God, the Father, calling out to his children, who are the people of Israel, 
and calling out to them to stop their constant and continual, and I would say intentional, disobedience. Instead of embracing those things, turn and return to him. So that in returning to him, they could experience him returning to them. And that rather than living in disobedience and brokenness and this consistent intentional rebellion, that they could experience a, re a restored and whole relationship with the God who called them to be his own people and loved them very much. We looked at this idea of how God saw the rebellion of his people and through the prophet Malachi, who he raised up, in order that they might return, he brought a series of six charges against his people. And we've looked at four so far. We looked at the idea, the first uh, week that we were in Mal Malachi, that they rejected God's love. They said, well, God, how have you loved us? Come on, God, you don't really love us, do you? And then the second week, we looked at how, when it came to worshiping God, they were bringing animals and sacrifices that were defective, that were no good, that were leftovers, that were diseased, that nobody else would even take. And they're offering to God, thinking that, hey, it's not good enough for us, but it might be good enough for God. We looked at this idea that they were dishonoring God through their marriages, that uh, rather than the Israelite men marrying the Israelite women who worshiped the one true God, uh, the Israelite men were actually forgetting about their status with God as God's special people and were rejecting that and were embracing this idea of marrying these women who worshiped idols and embracing that lifestyle. But more than that, just marrying them, they were actually leaving their spouses that they already had who were Israelite women so that they could be linked to these women who practice idolatry and they were actually breaking their marriage covenant with their spouse, but they were breaking a bigger covenant with God. And we looked at that idea. We also looked at the idea about how they were accusing God. And we saw this in an earlier chapter about how God uh, tolerates evil, but not only tolerates evil, that God actually likes evil and is powerless to stop evil and that there's no such thing as the God of justice. We looked at all these things that they were saying and God, every time they make up a charge, he answers back, and he gives a defense for who he truly is. And this morning, we're going to look at the fifth charge. Today, we're looking at how they were choosing to be stingy and cheapskates towards God. And as we dive in this morning, i got to give three quick disclaimers, okay? The first is that there is the common complaint against the church today is that the church is all about money. Maybe you've heard that. I know I have. People complain that the church is all about money, and the church just wants to get my money. And when I come to church, they just want my money, which is why I'm even hesitant to bring this up today, because... I don't want you to think that that's what we're about. We're not about your money. But I want to clarify that this morning that what I'm talking about is not about us making more money here as a church so we can meet your budget. It's not about us having some big cash flow so we can make expenditures that we think we need. What it is about is this. It's about you thriving in your relationship to God because you're doing what he asks of you to do. It's this idea of you being accountable to God, to being good stewards of the things that he has given you. And that's what it's about. And I'm just going to put a disclaimer in here this morning. That at the end of the day, it's between you and God. And if you say, you know what, hey, this church is all about money and I'm not going to give to it, you're not going to offend me. It's between you and God. And I fully believe that if, you know, if you don't want to give to the church, that God's still going to provide some other way. But it's about your relationship with God, and you are accountable to God for how you use his resources that he's given you. So that's the first disclaimer. The second is this, that pastors can often be guilty of using this passage to guilt people into giving to the church. Let me clarify that I don't want to guilt you into anything. And in fact, when we talk about money, what the Bible says is that God loves a cheerful giver, okay? He loves a cheerful giver, not the one who's like, Oh, well, the pastor said I had to give money, so he was my put it in, and hopefully they'll be happy and leave me alone for the rest of my life. It's not this guilt, obligation-driven thing. That's not what I want you to hear this morning. I don't want you to hear that it's about guilt. Really, my prayer this morning is that I simply want to let God speak through his word, and what happens between you and him is ultimately your business between you and God. The third thing is that pastors can also add things to what is said here that are just not biblical. And they can take these verses, they can use them for their own agendas. And really this morning, what I want to be careful to do, and if I'm not, please let me know, 
But I want to simply speak what the Bible teaches this morning and let God speak for himself. The bottom line is that we are all accountable to be good stewards of the stuff that God has given us. And this is where I want to land on this morning, that we all are accountable to God to do what God is asking us to do with the things that he has given us. I want to look together at Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. I'm going to put it up on the screen here and let me read it for you. Malachi 3, 7, here's how it reads. And this is going to be a bit of a review from last week as well. He says, Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Well, we looked more extensively at this verse last week. And in a nutshell, I'm not going to rehash it all, but what God is saying here is that you have been living in a pattern and in a cycle of unfaithfulness for a long, long time. Since the days of your forefathers, since the days of your ancestors, pretty much since the day of your founding. And he says, stop rebelling. Stop disobeying me. Instead, he says, choose to honor, love, and respect me by returning to me. And when you do that, my presence that you have enjoyed for so long will return to you. And we'll have a fixed and we'll have a right relationship. Now last week, we parked on that point that we stopped at the first part of verse 7. We didn't look at the rest. And I want you to see the response of the people here. He says, return to me and I will return to you. And what do they say? How are we to return? Um, when you see this, it reminds me of how all through the book of Malachi, each time the prophet Malachi brings a charge from God against the people of Israel. Their response is never one out of curiosity of, okay, what have we been doing? In the same case here, they're not saying, mm, well, how have we strayed? Like, how are we to return to you so we can have a good relationship with you? That's not what it's about. Actually, what's going on here is just, I'm, I'm going to say, pure indignation, entitlement, self-righteousness. And when they hear God say, return to me and I will return to you, they're saying, what in the world are you talking about? What do you mean return to you? So God, if you're all knowing, tell us, what is it we have done? God, you know better than anybody else apparently, and if you knew what you say you know, you'd know that we're justified in what we're doing. So take a hike, God. That's basically what they're saying here. They're in his face, and they're completely rebelling in what they're saying. They're saying, what do you mean? Tell us how we're going to return, God. Tell us. Now, God answers them in verse 8. I want to put it up on the screen. And here's how God answers them in, in uh, Malachi 3.8. Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. So God, through his prophet, tells the people that they have disobeyed God because even though they are only mere mortals, even though they are only human beings... And they are here, and the creator God is here in terms of hierarchy of God being all-powerful, God being all-knowing, God being all-providing, and they are just the created, not the creator. So you can understand the hierarchy that's there. He says, you guys who are mere human beings, you are choosing to rob the God of the universe here. And their response here is not just a simple curiosity because they want to know what they're doing wrong so they can come back and fix things. It's not a, oh, God, well, I'm sorry, how are we robbing you? It's, what are you talking about? How are we robbing you? Come on. God, do you really know what you're talking about? What are you talking about? God then lays it all out by mentioning something called the tithes and the offerings. Uh, for those of you who don't know and you've not heard that word tithe before, or this is a new concept, uh, the word tithe translates from an each ancient Hebrew word, which means a payment of a tenth. And I want to put up a verse in Leviticus chapter 27, starting in verse 30 through 33, that talks about this idea of tithing. And here's how it reads. A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Whoever would redeem any of their tithe must add a fifth of the value to it. Every tithe of the herd and flock, every tenth animal that passes under the shepherd's rod, will be holy to the Lord. No one may pick out the good from the bad or make any substitution. If anyone does make a substitution, both the animal and its substitute become holy and cannot be redeemed. So a tenth, a tithe, or a tenth as I'm going to call it, 
was a legal requirement that was instituted by God and enforced through the law. See, this passage in Leviticus is part of something called the law of Moses, that God had delivered through Moses to the people uh, some 1,000 years earlier than the book of Malachi, instructing them about how to live as God's chosen people while they're here on earth. How they were to live as set-apart people for God in every aspect of life. And how they treated the gifts that God had given them, the financial blessings and the, the material blessings, and how they responded to those, was a sign of who they belonged to. And he's talking here about that. And he was talking about the obligation that they had from God to give back to God out of the gifts that they're given. And the principle was this, that everything on this planet belongs to God, and he owns it all. And it's a reality that's actually backed up, we find, in a whole bunch of places in Scripture. One such verse is Psalm 50, verses 10 through 11. And here's how it reads. For every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountains, and the insects in the field are mine. And if we, I had verse 12 up there, I would see that it says there, I can kind of make it out. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the whole world is mine, and all that is in it. Everything we have, everything belongs to God. This world belongs to God and everything in it. And the idea with the tithe was, uh, was that because God was continually gracious, because he was loving and a good father who provided for all the needs of his people, as any good father would, out of all of their material possessions, which actually, like I said, belonged to God to begin with, he just gave to them out of what he already had to supply for their needs to take care of themselves. The first tenth, or tithe, was to be set aside legally as a requirement to give to God out of love and out of honor to him. A tithe was a legal requirement. Then he mentions something else in verse 8. He mentions this idea of an offering. Now, unlike a tithe, an offering was voluntary, and it did not have a set amount. But the understanding was, however, that with both the tithes and the offerings, when a person physically came to the temple to worship, they would bring with them their tenth, and the, which was their tithe, and their voluntary offering, and it would be brought to the temple and left in something called the storehouse, which the storehouse is basically the room where the grain went, where the, the fruit and the crops went, where the livestock went, where all the gifts that were given to God would go, and they would, they would sit in there, and they'd either be offered as sacrifices on the altar, or they'd be used for food for the priests and the Levites who would conduct worship there as per God's uh, regulations. Now, Oh, no wonder I've got my page background. Sorry about that. Helps me on the right page. Um, what the people were doing here was that they were either giving God the worst of their stuff, which we saw in Malachi chapter 1. If you remember way back then, we looked at this at the beginning of summer. The people were coming to worship, and the priests were coming to worship. And when you came to worship God and you came to offer a sacrifice, God had a restriction. He said, if you're going to sacrifice something, you bring the best of the best of the best. You bring the firstborn of your flock. Your firstborn male of a flock, and it has to be perfect without defect. And the people were bringing these sick animals that were dying, that were uh, far from perfect, and saying, here, God, that's good enough for you. Take it. They wouldn't even give it to the governor of their land. But they give it to God and say, well, God, it's good enough for you. You'll, you'll be fine with our second bests or third bests in some cases. So that could be could be what's going on when he talks about robbing God. That's probably part of what he's referring to here is them not bringing their best. But beyond that, I suspect that rather than bringing God something at all, they were choosing to hold on to what they had and said, you know what? This is actually mine. I've worked for this. I've been the one who's been tilling the ground. I've been the one who's been taking care of the sheep and seeing them uh, uh, breed and, and hurting them and making sure that the Cat, the, the, the baby sheep come out okay and raising them or, whatever, or the, the cattle or whatever else. And they're thinking, we're doing the hard work. It actually belongs to us. And maybe that's what was going on and they weren't giving God what was required. But however they were doing it, what they were doing is they were showing disrespect and disdain towards God. They're showing a lack of gratitude in his provision. And in their disrespect, they were actually robbing God. You know, I said earlier, how generous we are towards God speaks of our depth of love for him. In this case, they were robbing God, and that spoke to where their hearts were at before God. 
I want to keep reading in uh, verse 9. Here's how it reads. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to, enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. So verse 9 mentions that the whole land was under a curse. And the reason why is because there was disobedience in the land. The reason why they were under a curse is because they were disobeying. They were being cheap with God, and they weren't giving God what he deserved or what he even required. And like I mentioned earlier in our main thought, how generous we are towards God speaks of our depth of love for him. In their disobedience, in their giving to God, they were speaking out of a lack of depth of love for him. And as a result, because of this disobedience, because of their lack of love for God, or so the Howard is showing it, they were living as a cursed nation. Now, when we see that, it actually highlights a reality that was true in the Old Testament uh, time period. And it's not necessarily true in the same way today. And I'll clarify that a little bit later on. But there was this, this reality in the life of Israel that obedience to God seemed to result in blessing in material ways. And in this case, giving your tenth had a direct connection to your material well-being. If you did not give back to God, you could expect that you would not experience the prosperity that God wanted to give. Generally, those who lived in disobedience were not blessed physically. Now, if you remember back to other times in the series where we've looked, I've said several times that one of the issues that the people had coming back from exile into the land of Judah after they had been released, some of the reason why they were so ticked off to begin with and they were walking in rebellion is because they expected things to go back to the way they were, where they're living in prosperity and blessing. And when they walked in the land, shortly thereafter, they discovered there's still poverty in the land. There's still illness in the land. The crops weren't growing. Things weren't going like they thought they should. And they were walking in this blessing and prosperity. And I can't help but think that that might be part of the curse here that God was talking about. And the reason why they weren't prospering in the land, and the reason why they weren't doing well in the land like they thought they should, is because they first weren't honoring God with what he had given them. And there's a direct correlation. God tells them that if they return to him by giving back to him what he deserves and what he requires, that they will walk in blessing. And he goes further than that. He basically puts it on the line that if they doubt him for any reason whatsoever, and they doubt that he won't take care of them, they, they think that he won't, that they should test him and see in it because he wants to prove to them that he is faithful and that he will keep his word. And he uses this image here that's quite beautiful when you think about it. He talks about the floodgates opening and that the storehouse will be so full that there will be no more room. And when I think about the floodgates opening, like, I don't know where the nearest dam is to here, but picture a big dam crossing a river or crossing a lake. And you see a lot of water behind it, not much here. And all of a sudden that dam breaks and the water whoo, gushes through. And that's the image that God's trying to portray to his people here and give him because he wants them to understand that if they walk in obedience and they honor God truly with what they've been given, that he will provide for their needs. Now, I said needs. That's important because we often get needs and wants mixed up. But he will take care of their needs so that as they give, they're not going to be necessarily sitting there thinking, oh, I don't know if I can do it this month because I don't have the ability to do so. The idea is as they gave, God would supply so that giving wouldn't become an issue. He will take care of their needs. And he talks about, as the verses wrap up, about how all these plagues that were present on the land, the pests, the crops that do not produce, all these things that he will actually hold back so that the nation can experience prosperity again and that the other nations can look around and say, wow, this is a blessed nation that the Lord Almighty is in charge of. All nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Now, I want to give a clarification out this morning. I said I was going to get to this in just a minute, and here it is. 
this is not an endorsement of the prosperity gospel this morning. I am not any stretch saying this morning that as long as you give money to the church, you will be driving a Lamborghini or a Porsche. And you'll have a huge house leading out of Hanover with a fountain in front and that curved driveway that'll almost look like a, like a colonial white house. And by the way, as long as you give money, you're never going to have any health problems whatsoever. And you're never going to have struggles in your family and life will be perfect and you'll never have to worry about it. I'm not saying that. Never am I saying that. Now, I do believe that God can fully bless us materially if he so wants, and he does. I have been recipients of God blessing material, materially many times, and I'm grateful for it. But this isn't always the pattern or expectation. The understanding is that God provides by meeting the needs of those who understand that what they have, God already owns. That's important. What you have, God already owns, and it actually belongs to God. So you don't get all this stuff so you can build an empire of, look what I have. Everything you have belongs to God. And out of what he already owns, as you give away what he has given you, and you say, hmm, I'm not sure how I'm going to pay the bills this month, that God, and it doesn't make sense, but God, out of his riches that he has that are unending, he can provide for you whatever it is that you actually need to take care of yourself as long as you're faithful to what he has given you to begin with. And you're doing it with it what he asks you to do. It was a promise by God to his disobedient people who were withholding money because they didn't have enough to give, even though they were spending it on their own pleasures. It was a promise that if they were worried about how they could afford to give, test God and see what he could do for him, for them rather. And there's an, uh, kind of an unspoken principle in this too. That the more God blesses you, the more you are to give away. God doesn't give to you so that you can sit on a pile of wealth and say, hey, look at all the nice stuff I have. God gives to you so you can be a blessing of Jesus Christ in the world. He gives to you so you can take what belongs to him and you can invest it in somebody else's life for his glory, his honor, and his goodness and his message. He gives so you can give it away. It's a beautiful thing. I'm going to begin to wrap up here. You know, at the start of the series, I asked you this question. I said, I asked you, how do you need to return to God? How do you need to return to God? And this morning I want to ask, do you need to return to God in how generous you are towards him? How generous we are towards God speaks of our depth of love for him. You know, I want to challenge you this morning. The first thing is be generous with what God, with God, with what you have been given. Be generous with God, with what you have been given. So I got to ask this morning: What are your reasons for not giving to God if you aren't this morning? Why are you holding back? Is it because of ownership? Do you say, "Hey, you know, the money that I got in my bank account, in my bank account, my money, I've worked hard for with my job, and I've toiled and sweated away at this stuff, and it's my money that I worked hard for, and you know what? I need it for my things." Do we have a sense of ownership that suddenly everything we have belongs to us? You know, everything is a gift from God. Everything we have is a gift from God. He owns it. And that job that you love today, or maybe the job that you don't love so much, the money that you do have, or maybe the money that you don't have when you look at your bank account, everything you have is a gift from God. Everything. Everything. When you live in the perspective that it is all yours, that you have provided, the problem is you miss out on the valuable dynamic of your Christian life. And I came across a quote this week. I read this way. Human presumption of total ownership in a world in which God owns everything is deeply resistant to real worship and devotion. So here's the thing. You're going to miss out on what God wants for you if you're going to hold on to what doesn't belong to you to begin with. So the application here is support the things of God with the gifts of God. Support the things of God with the gifts of God. Uh, in order for you to experience that deep relationship, that vibrancy with God that you're designed for, part of that comes out of you realizing that everything I have belongs to God. And God, you do with it whatever you please, and I want to honor you with it. 
I would say this morning that if you're connected to a church and you are benefiting from the ministry there, that this is a thing that the church is a thing of God that you can support with the gifts of God. And if you're part of a church this morning and you're connected to, the, to a church, and this is not a plug for money for us, because not everybody's from this church. But if you're part of a church and you're connected to a church, then your home church really should be the priority where you give. It should be the place where you give the first fruits that you have to his work through your home church. Um, now, we don't necessarily rule ourselves anymore with a 10% rule, but something called a rule of sacrifice. And I want to put a couple of verses up here quickly, and I want to explain what I mean. You will know this one from Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched the crowd putting their money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything all she had to live on. We'll chew on that in a minute. I also want to put up 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7. And here's how it reads. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So just a couple quick things on here. Jesus' issue with those in the temple that day who are putting in their sacrifice, those who are giving, putting in their offering. Jesus' issue with them was not that they weren't giving 10%, because I'm fully convinced that they were. They are fully adhering to the law and maybe putting a little bit in extra for, for added benefit. But the thing is, is what they're giving didn't come out of a place of sacrifice. You see, they had so much that their 10% was like pocket change. Whereas the widow comes in who has nothing, and she gives out of what she has at the point where it's a sacrifice where she says, I'm going to put this in. And what she's implicitly saying is, I'm not going to be able to pay what needs to be paid, but I'm going to trust that God's going to provide and that God's going to be faithful to his word. And she gave out of a place of sacrifice. You see, we can't just put, set the bar at, an, at a certain thing and say, well, I've given my amount for the month and I'm good. Because if it's not affecting your heart, then it's not really an act of worship. It's got to affect your heart. And I heard one person put it this way. Give to the point where the sacrifice no longer hurts, but it feels good. Chew on that for a minute. Give to the point where the sacrifice no longer hurts, but it feels good. You know, there's that point where you're like, oh, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And there's that point where you cross that line and you realize, okay, you know what? <laughs> God, I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm going to give to you what belongs to you, and I know someone else is going to be blessed by this, and I'm going to trust you, and you feel a sense of blessing and joy because you know you're obeying God and doing what God asks you to do. 2 Corinthians talks about this idea of deciding in your heart and giving cheerfully. Don't give under restriction. Don't give under obligation. But give out of cheerfulness because of who God is for you and what he's done in your life and how you love him. Give generously to him because of that. Give to his work. Okay, next thought is this. When we give to God, we can expect him to provide. So what are your reasons not for giving? Is it because you don't think you have enough? Another quote I heard this week was this. Withholding from God what is already his is on par with not recognizing his authority overall and submitting to it. Here's the thing. Um, God has authority over all things. And life does go better when we give, even when things are tight, because God somehow, because he has this authority, and it defies human logic, God can make money appear where money isn't there. And no, this is not a get-rich-quick scheme. It is not something that you can see on TV, oh, just pray, and here's your money, and as seen on TV, you will get rich. No, that's not what I'm talking about this morning. It's not a scheme. But God can do it. God can take care of you. He owns it all. It all belongs to him. And I'm telling you, personally, that I've been recipients of this numerous times. And there have been times where it was a struggle for me to give because I looked and said, where is the money going to come from? And I'll be completely honest with you, there, there are days still even now where I struggle because I'm like, okay, this is our bank balance. 
and we're going to give this, but this could be used for a lot of other things that I think are important too. Okay, God, you're going to have to provide. And I kid you not that over the years, as, as I have learned to be faithful, and it's been a hard journey, trust me, but as I've learned to be faithful, God has provided and he's never let us down. Sometimes it's in very strange, unconventional ways. Like five years ago when the U-Haul trailer burnt up with all our stuff in it. That's a weird act of provision. But let me tell you that when God provided through the insurance money, he was able to bless us beyond we could even imagine. It was hard, but boy, did God bless us in the end. But you've got to be faithful. There were times where, you know, we were giving to God, and then we had some unexpected expense. And at another church we were at, we went to our mailbox. In our mailbox at the church was an anonymous card with $500 in it, saying, here, pay your bills. Pay that unexpected power bill that came up that you weren't expecting, that catch-up bill for the year. It's like, okay, hey, God provides. Test me and see. It's a scriptural principle. Give, and God will take care of you. He will take care of your needs. You don't need to be worried. The last one is this. There's a larger principle here. Okay, so this speaks beyond money. And it applies to the rest of your life. And while this passage doesn't explicitly say this, it's a good, it translates over. Don't be stingy with God over the rest of your life. Not only money does God provide, but he provides time. He provides your house. He provides your food. He provides the gifts that you have, the abilities that you have. Every day of your life is a gift from God. And you can offer it as an offering to him. I want to put up Romans 12.1 because I think this sums it up very well. I'm going to invite Quinn and the team to come forward, actually, and take their place on stage here. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So here's the thing. Your whole life is to be offered to God as an offering to him, as a gift to him. And when you view your life as a gift, it's pretty hard to be stingy and cheap with it. When you view your life as a gift from God, and you realize that God's given you the time you have to love people, to invest in their lives, to share in their lives, that God's given you the food in your fridge and the excess that you are looking thinking, you know, I could really enjoy that chocolate cake today, but actually I don't really need it. You can take that chocolate cake over to someone that you know down the street who's maybe their mother or father just passed away and they're looking for love and looking for someone who cares and that chocolate cake could be the blessing in their life that God has given you to give away. Maybe you are a skilled carpenter which automatically rules me out, as you know. Maybe you are a skilled carpenter and you can build things and you know what? That person down the road, uh, there was a windstorm that blew through and it knocked down their shed and they're not sure what they're going to do because they don't have money to rebuild it and they don't have the ability to hire somebody. You think, you know what? Hey, I've got a few free days over the weekend and I can help them frame that thing back up and put it back up. And you've got an ability you can use. Maybe you know somebody who is between homes that, you know, something has happened and they don't have anywhere to stay. And, you know, God's given you that extra space in your house. You're thinking, you know, what can I do with that? I know this is radical. I know this is uncomfortable for us. But what can I do with that? Invite somebody in to stay in your home and share your home with them because that's a gift too. Now, on a church level, and this is where I'm going to be careful, but it needs to be said, God has given each one of you gifts to use here in the church. And he invites each one of you to serve here as a member of this family, as a member of this community. And I got to ask you this morning, what are you doing with it? Are you investing it? Or are you holding it back for yourself? Now, this morning, I know some of you are saying, you know what, physically, I'm not able to do a whole lot. And I understand that. But I know some of you this morning who are getting up in years are amazing prayer warriors. And I need you. We need you in this church to pray and invest your life in prayer. But there's some of us who, you know, we're just saying, you know, my time and season's past. I don't need to be involved. Or we go back to past disagreements and say, you know what, because this and this happened many years ago, 
forget it. I don't need to be involved. I want to be sensitive, but at the same point, I need to speak some reality from Scripture. God never says just because you're ticked off at your church, you shouldn't be involved. And at the end of the day, this is not to be a guilt trip. You have to answer for the usage of the gifts God has given you. He gives you gifts so you can serve. And you know what? It's going to be uncomfortable at first, but just think. There's such a huge blessing when you can see what you think is a small, insignificant act of service transforming someone's life because Jesus is working through you. So I know I've been a little long-winded this morning, but all is to say, be generous with God in every aspect of your life, in your gifts, in your time, in your abilities, in the possessions you have, and yes, be generous with God with the finances that he has blessed you with as well, too. Be blessed. Team, won't you lead us?
Today, may we know that the Spirit of God is here, that He has been so generous to us, that He has given us life, and even more as we've sung today in that closing song, the love that is here to surround us and to embrace us. So the generosity begins with our relationship with Jesus. And no matter what we're facing, there's that beautiful image of breathe, as we said in the beginning, no matter what we face, just breathe. And it's that hands of God that are underneath us. They uphold us. That's what his word says. God will not let you fall. He will be there. His hands are there. And Christ has gone. Christ has given it all. So we may be in relationship with God. And just extend that to God embraces us. So as you go from here today, may you know the generosity of God. May you feel that love and may you long to share that love with others. Through that generosity, may you give to others that you come in contact with. And may they be blessed. May they know about the Spirit of God. That is what it means to be the people of God to share the love and generosity of God with others. So may you go in peace this week, knowing God is with you no matter what you face. His arms are underneath you, and they are surrounding you with the love and care that only God can give, no matter what you face. So go, go in peace, and go in the love of God. Amen. <laughs>